Welcome to Radio Who, What, Why. I'm Jeff Schechtman. No matter how much some may want to pull up the proverbial drawbridge and preach America first, the world is an interconnected place. The free flow of money around the globe, of jet travel and modern telecommunications, make the forces of globalization inevitable. And if those forces aren't enough, the ability of disease to travel across the globe should be another reminder. The fear that permeated all of us during the 2014-2015 Ebola outbreak in Africa is a grim and hopefully constant reminder. In fact, some argue that the greatest threat to the planet today is not just climate change or the threat of nuclear weapons, but the real threat of global pandemic. That's our subject this week as we talk to my guest, Reed Wilson. Reed Wilson is a national correspondent for The Hill in Washington. He covers politics and public policy in elections. He has examined all sides of this issue of public health in his new book, Epidemic, Ebola and the Global Scramble to Prevent the Next Killer Outbreak. And it is my pleasure to welcome Reed Wilson to Radio Who, What, Why. Reed, thanks so much for joining us. Well, thanks for having me. One of the things that's remarkable about this story, and perhaps it shouldn't be, But then when we look at something like a global pandemic or the potential that the Ebola crisis had, how much of it gets caught up, how much of the attempt to deal with it gets caught up in politics, not just domestic politics, but global politics for that matter? Yeah, a lot of it does. And I think we can see that uh, in evidence in this latest Ebola outbreak that's taking place right now in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Uh, We've seen the World Health Organization race in there, but only after the invitation of the local health ministry, the health ministry of the DRC. Uh, And that's really what happened in uh, West Africa. Uh, The the World Health Organization is this global body that we all think of as the the group that's going to come and save us. But, yeah, in fact, uh, it is sort of the patron of its client states. And in the early days of the outbreak, there were you know, tourism ministers in Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea, the places that we're talking about in terms of this outbreak, who were leery, uh, obviously, of having uh, you know, some, the, the presence of Ebola in their country well known. Uh, these are desperately poor countries that were uh, only just recovering from decades of civil war. And to have something like Ebola hit them uh, would demand diminish their standing, they thought, in the, the, world, uh, the, the world hierarchy, and uh, therefore they were a little leery about inviting the WHO in. So uh, you know, the, the politics at play, are they're global, they're national, and in a lot of cases they're local. Um, this virus hit a part of – it started in a part of Guinea and then spread over to rural Liberia and Sierra Leone that are far away from uh, the capitals of each of these three countries. And there is a, you know, centuries of mistrust between the local centralized governments, which are mostly made up of the descendants of uh, American slaves, and uh, the more rural areas that are dominated by tribes that have been there for thousands of years. Uh, so the, the distrust uh, and, and the politics begins at the local level, and it filters all the way up to these big global international bodies uh, that we think are poised to save us. And did the crisis in 2004, the Ebola crisis in 2014, 2015, did that provide some kind of a cautionary tale to these countries in terms of how devastating it can be? Yeah, I think it did. And, and not just these countries, but to the world at large. You know, I say the WHO wasn't uh, entirely prepared to race in and and, uh, and contain this virus. As a matter of fact, a lot of it was left up to the American Centers for Disease Control and Prevention uh, to go into, and, and, and I should say, you know, groups from across the world, the United Kingdom uh, and uh, some NGOs there, France, Italy, uh, even Germany and Denmark uh, did a lot to uh, uh, to prevent the virus uh, from spreading further. Uh, but it was, it certainly... A cautionary note because the big international systems that we thought were in place to fight back against a pandemic simply weren't there and they weren't able to, uh, to, to do their job. The WHO had no list of doctors who could volunteer uh, at the drop of a hat or uh, contractors who could uh, fly in you know, pallets of body bags and, and chlorine solution to, to spray everything and kill the virus. In the wake of the outbreak, uh, 
WHO has undergone a remarkable round of, of self-flagellation, really, and, and reorganized itself uh, into a, an organization that's much more able to respond to one of these outbreaks. And again, we're seeing that now in the, the Democratic Republic of the Congo. The director general of the WHO was in the, the hot zone itself just days after the, uh, this latest outbreak was confirmed, essentially showing that, hey, the WHO is now an organization that is able to respond to something like this. Uh, and, of course, you know, the next big one that we're talking about, it's, it's not really going to be Ebola. Um, Ebola is, is difficult to spread between humans. You actually have to touch, you know, blood or guts to, to get it uh, yourself. The next one is going to be something that spreads easily among humans and, is, uh, and, and has a, a high lethality. It's probably going to be something like a flu. So, all right, the WHO is good at responding to a, a virus like Ebola, but what about the next SARS? What about the next bird flu that comes out of some bird market in China or something like that, will they be prepared to respond to something at that scale? That's something we don't know yet. And when we look at the totality of this, what role did other NGOs play in this crisis? And what role might they play going forward today, groups like Doctors Without Borders? Yeah, Doctors Without Borders is the they're, they're sort of the real heroes of this story. Um, this is a an amazing organization that goes into uh, places all over the world um, and and to respond to uh, whether it's a health crisis like the Ebola outbreak or a, a war or a famine or something like that. Um, one of the one of the Doctors Without Borders volunteers who I spoke to for this book uh, is a guy named Craig Spencer. He he got the Ebola virus himself. He's a doctor up in New York. Um, he just emailed me the other day and said he was on his way uh, to a rescue boat in the Mediterranean where he's going to uh, help uh, pick up, you know, migrants who are, who are put on these, these, you know, little dinghies, these overcrowded little dinghies in Libya and sent over to, to Italy. So a really amazing organization that does incredible work. And uh, they were the ones who really uh, stepped up in, in creating Ebola treatment units, uh, the places where people would actually be, um, would be treated. They were among the first uh, into the fight. Uh, they were the ones who, who were able to sort of begin treating patients and figuring out how to bring the mortality rate of Ebola down from, you know, 80 or 90 percent to 40 or 50, which is still a, an amazingly high mortality rate. But of course, you're saving a lot more people that way. Um, other NGOs are groups like uh, Global Communities. It's an American-based NGO that's operated in Liberia for years. Uh, they operated uh, sanitation systems and, and taught people about the links between open sanitation and cholera. Well, they were able to transform their teams that would go village to village and dig these uh, safe latrines and things like that into uh, teams, uh, burial teams, teams that were uh, tasked with taking a body of somebody who had died from the Ebola virus and giving it a, a safe burial because what they found out was about 70% of all the Ebola transmissions were coming as people came into contact with dead bodies. Um, this is here, here, by the way, another lesson from the Ebola outbreak. One thing we learned was that anthropology matters as much as the hard sciences. So when you're burying a body, you can't just, you know, take somebody's loved one and, and throw it in a grave. You have to show respect. You have to uh, talk to the, to the family about who this deceased person was, what they're going to do in the afterlife, uh, and then uh, pick up the body in, you know, in full view of the family, uh, disinfect it, uh, uh, bury it safely, uh, all in, in view of a family that is obviously mourning because they just lost their, lost their loved one and a family that demands actual respect for, for the, the deceased. So um, the cultural traditions there were a big, huge lesson uh, that a group like Global Communities was able to, to impart. There are also, by the way, I should point out, faith groups that played a huge role in a lot of places. Um, in, in Sierra Leone, uh, groups like uh, World Vision, you know, the, you, you've seen them because they're the, the group that runs TV ads that says, hey, 30 cents a day or something can save a kid's life. Well, they've, they had something like 56,000 sponsored kids in Sierra Leone. Uh, they worked with, their, their, with faith leaders, both uh, Christian and Muslim. Uh, this is a part of the story that I absolutely love, the, the sort of the Muslim imams and the Christian ministers standing side by side and talking to their congregations about how to stay safe. Uh, World Vision uh, ended up spreading that message and then becoming a, a system of burial teams that are sending out a, a group of burial teams themselves. Um, and of those, you know, 56,000 kids that they have sponsored, not a single one in Sierra Leone got sick. Talk a little bit about the global mobilization that took place then and what we learned from it with respect to its spreading beyond the, hot, the original hot zone. 
Right. The uh, global mobilization was, was pretty slow. Uh, the very first person who got the Ebola virus was a two-year-old boy named Emil in a tiny village in Meliandu, which is up in the mountains of rural Guinea. Uh, he got it in December of 2013. Uh, it, the World Health Organization didn't know that there was anything wrong, or the local health ministries too, didn't know anything was wrong until about late January when they went into this, this area and they thought they were looking at a cholera epidemic, a cholera outbreak. Uh, because they didn't know to look for Ebola. Ebola is not endemic to this part of Africa. It's endemic to the Congo River Basin, which is effectively 2,500 miles away. I mean, it's basically as far away as, as you are, you and I are right now. I'm in Washington, D.C. Um, so they didn't know what they were looking at. Uh, a few months later, uh, Doctors Without Borders uh, got involved, and, and the WHO got some samples. They both tested those samples at about the same time in late March of 2014, and finally realized they had Ebola. The first teams uh, from uh, uh, Doctors Without Borders, WHO, started arriving in, in March. The first teams from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention arrived in April. But the full-scale response didn't really start until August, uh, when people realized that there was a, a real serious problem here. Uh, and the reason is because the West Africa is a much different place than the Congo River Basin. Uh, the Congo River Basin, you, you, it's, it's difficult to travel. You've basically got to go up and down the river if you're even on the river. So if this breaks out in a remote village, it's going to infect the people in that village and probably nobody else. West Africa is a much more trade-based sort of uh, uh, transient uh, uh, region where people routinely cross borders and, and travel to the capital to trade uh, to bring their goods uh, from, from one city to another. And that meant that the virus had a lot more vectors to get out of this tiny little village of Meliandu and into first surrounding towns and then across borders and then to these big mega capitals that have, you know, a million people and, and uh, some of the most densely packed slums in the world. Um, so the, the spread of the virus, it, it, it happened because we are a transient, that, that region is a transient society. And I would say that's how the world is these days. So we're, we travel much more now than we ever have before. The you know, booming middle classes of, of Africa and Asia are traveling to Europe and the Middle East and the United States. And, and of course, the booming middle class in the United States is traveling to all of these other places, too. This is the big thing. I, I, sorry for the tangent, but uh, every time somebody says, well, if we just put up a, a wall and, and, and ban travel, it's like, no, you know, Americans like to travel, too. And you're not going to keep Americans overseas uh, if, they, if they come down with something like this. So the bottom line is we are in becoming an increasingly interconnected world, and that is how any of these viruses can spread further. It seems like the other part of that problem, to just stay on that, that point for a moment, is not only are we increasingly interconnected, but the difference even from four years ago, the, the initial Ebola crisis, that there's so much more nativism at play today, so much more desire to close off borders, and the danger that that poses today. Yeah, I, I think so. I, and uh, the the notion of of closing off borders is you know, vi viruses don't know anything about international borders, right? They don't, they, they're not going to respect one of the, uh, a border. Um, every pandemic that, that we know of it has, has spread regardless of, of what kinds of, uh, of travel bans we place. And by the way, in, when it came to West Africa, you know, there were a lot of people in, in Congress who were calling for travel bans uh, from West Africa. Uh, anybody who'd been there, they didn't want them to come to the United States. That has a side effect of keeping people who want to go help out of the out of the hot zone. So basically, if if any American, uh, you know, Doctors Without Borders volunteer or CDC official or or even members of the U.S. Army uh, wanted to go help in West Africa, uh, they would have been prohibited from from traveling back to the United States. You don't want to do that because that robs you of the people who are going to solve this crisis. Uh, as it happened, after the United States sent 3,000 American troops over there, not a single one of whom got sick. Uh, when they came back, they did spend 21 days in quarantine. Uh, I talked to a few of them who did. They said it was the most boring 21 days of their <laughs> entire lives. Talk a little bit about the role of the CDC and the U.S. military in this particular crisis. 
Right. So the CDC is it really underwent a massive transi- transformation uh, during this outbreak. This is a this is an agency that used to pat itself on the back when they sent a dozen or two dozen people uh, out into the field to combat some kind of viral outbreak. In the course of this outbreak, they deployed more than 1,400 people, uh, sometimes two or three times, uh, into the hot zone. And what uh, they focused their efforts mainly in Liberia, which has the closest relationship with the United States. Sierra Leone has a very close relationship with the UK. Guinea has a very close relationship with France. So they sort of divided up the, the responsibility that way. Uh, but there were CDC teams doing literally everything in the outbreak. Uh, some people uh, organized the, the response. They, they sort of coordinated the entire response at emergency operations centers that were funded by people like Paul Allen and the CDC Foundation. Uh, they uh, operated the response here at home. They prepared hospitals across the country to get ready for uh, – it, for an Ebola patient to walk through the door. Before this uh, outbreak, there were only four facilities in the U.S. that could have treated somebody with Ebola in isolation. Today, there are more than 50, and one in every state, and uh, in some states, several. Um, in, in West Africa, they handled contact tracing, which is uh, making sure that you, you know if somebody comes down with Ebola, you track everybody that they've come into contact with because those are the people who are now most likely to get Ebola themselves. Um, and, you know, they even did um, things like border control. They, uh, these are, you know, the borders between these three countries and, and other countries were drawn a, a century and a half ago by cartographers in, in Paris and London. Um, you know, they, they don't make a lot of sense to the, the tribes who actually live there, so the borders are very porous. Well, you've got to track who's going back and forth so you can track the spread of the virus and therefore understand how, uh, how much you sort of have to respond uh, in certain areas. So they even handled border control. What changed, if anything, once the virus made its way to New York? Well, uh, so the the virus um, first came to the United States in uh, October when it uh, when a, a man named Thomas Eric Duncan boarded a flight in Liberia and traveled to Dallas. That was really a, a wake up call uh, because it it showed that that travel happens and that people uh, are coming across borders regardless of whether or not you can um, you, you, you implement some kind of flight ban or something like that. Um, a few weeks later, another, well, let's see, a few months later, uh, another volunteer, a, a doctor from Doctors Without Borders, uh, Craig Spencer, got back to, to New York and, and you know, a, a common theme in the people who uh, served over there over in West Africa and then came back is depression because this was a, uh, a an outbreak where basically it was easier to count the survivors than it was to count those who died because there were just fewer survivors um, it was a, a terrifying moment to be actually on the ground in West Africa and so when people came back they they suffered through a lot of depression Craig Spencer felt that same way and then a few days later, he started to feel these aches and pains. He sort of woke up one morning and realized something wasn't right. He was exhausted. Um, he, he was uh, sweating all over the place. His temperature was starting to rise. And, and that was a moment when Americans – uh, realized that, that this virus could get to, get to the United States. And it was also a moment when another client of, uh, sort of a, a client of the U.S. government, if you will, uh, American hospitals started paying a lot of attention. This was before there were a ton of hospitals that could handle an isolation patient. Uh, and so the hospital that he went to, he went to uh, Bellevue Hospital in New York, uh, ended up sort of being the test case. And a lot of people were, a lot of hospitals were super nervous about treating an Ebola patient and the, the, uh, being seen as a place where somebody with Ebola might go um, because the hospital in Dallas that treated Thomas Eric Duncan had lost so much business afterwards. People didn't want to go to a place that had treated an Ebola patient. So um, it was a, a moment when American hospitals were uh, deciding whether or not to, to essentially build their capacity to treat an Ebola patient. And, uh, it, and they, Bellevue itself, got the support of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, uh, which, by the way, the head at the time, Thomas Frieden, had been uh, the public health commissioner of New York City, so he knew the hospitals pretty well. Uh, And the the CDC really tried, and the U.S. government, really tried to show hospitals around the country, if you get an Ebola patient, we will have your back, we will give you all kinds of support. Uh, And that mattered a lot. That sort of uh, incentivized a whole bunch of hospitals to uh, uh, get ready, effectively, and to um, uh, prepare for the next Ebola crisis. So, 
that that moment in New York was was an important one uh, because it helped prepare hospitals in every other state to get ready for the next pandemic if it were to come. Mm-hmm. If the event were to happen today, what might be different? Um, I, I think, well, we're, we're seeing the event happening today, and I think a couple of things are different. Uh, in, you know, this, this outbreak in West Africa hit a small, I'm sorry, this outbreak in, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo that's going on right now started in a small village. It moved to a, a village uh, near the Congo River, and then, terrifyingly enough, it hit a city of about a million people uh, that's actually on the Congo River. Now, that's scary because the, the river, people can travel upriver to uh, one uh, foreign capital and downriver to three foreign capitals capitals, including Kinshasa, which is a city of, of like 12 million people. Um, so there's, there's a little terrifying moment. The difference is uh, the international response happened almost immediately in this case. It took about four months in West Africa to identify the Ebola virus. Uh, in this case, it probably took about a month. They're still looking for the very first case, the, what we call the index case. Uh, but within days of the first uh, acknowledgement that the Ebola virus had broken out, uh, there were teams on the ground, and we now have a vaccine for the Ebola virus. And, and so the, there have been about 1,200 people in these, these three cities that have had contact with Ebola patients that have been given the vaccine. Frontline healthcare workers have been given the vaccine. You know, hopefully it, it ends up working. We won't actually know that it does until about two months from now when, when the, uh, the, the, the sort of incubation periods have, have ended in, in these three communities. Um, but uh, the, the response has been amazingly fast. I talked to uh, the, this man named Pierre Roland. He's the CDC's like, chief Ebola expert, uh, and he was, he was getting on a plane the next day, you know, two days after uh, this declaration of an outbreak had, had taken place, uh, to go and to go experience what, um, or to go see what was actually happening in, in the DRC and to deploy themselves. Uh, the CDC maintains an office in Kinshasa. They have deployed up to the hot zone uh, themselves to, to help with the uh, with uh, the, the response and groups like Doctors Without Borders. Doctors Without Borders opened three Ebola treatment units in the space of about a week, which is really impressive in terms of speed. Uh, it, it takes a lot to open a facility like that, and uh, they now have, have sort of demonstrated that they're the first line responders who are able to open a place like that in just a blink of an eye. Of course, the other danger, and, and there's familiarity with Ebola at this point, is some other disease spreading that we're less familiar with at this point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. The World Health Organization every year puts together a list of uh, uh, of diseases that need to be given research priority. Um, and it, so it starts with, you know, AIDS and Ebola and, and Lassa, hemorrhag- hemorrhagic fever and things like that. Um, but they have just recently added another one to the list that they're calling Disease X. And Disease X is the unknown. Uh, the, uh, and and it, it's the one that, uh, that could spread. It, yeah. Look, the, the most... The, the, the thing that keeps doctors up or you know, public health officials up at night is something that has the lethality of Ebola, the transmissibility and, and, the, and the prevalence of something like Zika. Uh, now, Zika is a virus that if, if you or I get it, it's not going to do anything to us. It only basically affects uh, fetuses. Um, However, it is much more easily transmissible and much more widely transmissible because the, the, its carrier, these mosquitoes, uh, are basically everywhere. We blame climate change for that one. Um, the fact is that uh, if, if you combine the, the spread, uh, spreadable disease like Zika and a lethal disease like Ebola uh, and then add in human-to-human transmission, which is not something that, that Zika can do, uh, that's what keep, keeps doctors up at night. And that means it's probably a flu. The next big thing, you know, here, here we are in 2018, 100 years after the Spanish flu killed something like 50 to 100 million people around the globe. And the Spanish flu had a mortality rate of about 2.5%. Uh, the Ebola at the moment in, in West Africa had a mortality rate of somewhere north of 40%. So, all right, if you get something of the scale of Ebola with the spread of, of the Spanish flu, that's going to scare the public health. That's the next disease X effectively. And not to scare everybody or all your listeners, but there is a flu in China right now that's not terribly transmissible between people, but it has broken out a few times in, in some bird markets that has a mortality rate of 35 to 40 percent. Uh, so that's, that's pretty scary. That's what doctors are watching right now. Uh, and then again, it's disease X. This, if, if, even if they get a handle on this particular flu, there might be another one that comes up. 
And practically speaking, what is the need for more funding globally to deal with all of this? So the, the need is, is severe. And, and think about it like this. The, the global public health system, as, as we saw in West Africa, um, a virus can get on a plane. And it has gotten on a plane several times, um, in, both in previous outbreaks and in this outbreak. Uh, planes traveling to Europe, planes traveling to Nigeria, planes traveling to uh, the United States. The global public health system is only as strong as its weakest link. And there are a lot of very weak links, especially in places like Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, when, you, when you think about Liberia, Guinea, and Sierra Leone, uh, I mean, they, the, the GDP of, of Liberia is 1% of what it is here in the United States. Um, they don't spend a lot of money on public health. Uh, Death is not uncommon in, in West Africa, and that, that is just sort of a fact of life, whether it's cholera or Lhasa or Ebola or something, like, something else like that. Um, if because the world is becoming so interconnected, the, the health systems in Liberia matter to the United States and matter to Europe and matter to any one of us who live in this globalized society. I mean, if you want to go uh, you know, lock yourself away in a, in a cabin in the mountains, great, good for you, but uh, that's not how, how the rest of us live. And, uh, and, and therefore, without sort of bolstering these, this public uh, spending, public health spending in places like Sierra Leone, Guinea, West Africa, and Congo, uh, then you know we're we're going to see more viruses spreading more widely across the rest of the country, uh, rest, the rest of the world. What about spending here in the U.S. at places like CDC, and also in terms of looking at the broader coordination of this through interagency actions in Washington? Yeah, and, and that has happened a lot more. It, it's interesting. I, I, in talking to the, a lot of the people who responded, um, they all said that the, the humanitarian responders, the people who respond to you know, uh, earthquakes or, or floods or tornadoes or things like that, and the, and the virus responders, the, the CDC, had always kind of viewed each other with suspicion. Um, they, they didn't get along. They didn't talk much. They didn't have to. After this, the, the two groups sort of uh, headlined by the CDC and USAID, the Agency for International Development, developed this really close working relationship. And they realized we don't have to build, have this wall. This, this is sort of an artificial wall between two kinds of response that, uh, that doesn't make a lot of sense. So they ended up tearing down that wall, uh, operating a very close working relationship. And, and now they're both sort of asking for uh, the, the funding that they need to spend less here in the United States and more elsewhere, more around the rest of the world, so that they can engage in this disease surveillance, so that they can identify the next disease X that pops up. Um, one thing that's a little troubling right now is, the, 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 remember the Ebola supplemental bill, the bill that Congress passed uh, to, deal, to, to deal with this Ebola crisis, that money is running out. And as a matter of fact, the Trump administration has uh, proposed clawing back about $250 million from that supplemental uh, bill. And, and saving the money effectively. Well, that was money that was going to be spent on uh, bolstering public health systems in some other countries. And at the moment, the CDC operates in 49 countries around the world where they do this sort of disease surveillance and keep a lookout for the next killer virus. Uh, they, it, when this money runs out, they're going to have to cut back on 39 of those 49 countries. They'll only continue to operate in 10. So if we don't fund CDC and USAID to the, the appropriate level, that makes the rest of the global public health system more tenuous and, and you know, not as able to respond to the next disease. And in turn, that makes all of us less safe. And where does Western Europe fit into this equation then? Well, they have, they, especially the UK, uh, have done a, well, just a, a, as much as the American CDC has. Um, the, uh, the, the UK's version of it is called... Um, uh, U UK FID, I think it is, uh, something like that. There's also the Welcome Trust in the UK. Um, as I said, you know, the German government, the French government, the Italian government, the Danish government all sent uh, uh, aid. And I mean, in some cases, like the Danish government paid for um, uh, little like playing cards that talked about the danger of Ebola. These sort of, you know, it sounds like a tchotchke, but hey, that's the way you communicate with uh, people in rural villages who, who don't have a radio to listen in or, or a television or something like that. Um, so it, all of these governments in Western Europe chipped in quite significantly. And again, they've done so in 
this outbreak in in West Af- in, in the Democratic Republic of Congo that's going on right now. Um, the U.S. government has given about five million dollars uh, to, uh, to to respond to this virus. Um, Germany has given a, a, a mil- I think it was a million pounds the last time I, I've seen I saw it or a million euros. Um, the U.K. government has chipped in. Uh, several different branches of the U.K. government have chipped in money. Um, so this is it, it, the the global response is not just Americans. It is also Europeans and uh, increasingly, by the way, the Chinese are getting into the game. Um, the Chinese have a version of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. They've learned a lot from from the U.S. and they're trying to be more sort of a, more of a presence on the global stage, not just in terms of you know taking over the South China Sea or or uh, raiding Africa of its of its uh, 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 you know rare minerals, but also of trying to do something on the humanitarian side. And they have a, a huge presence in Africa right now. That's right, they do uh, in in all parts of Africa, uh, from you know West Africa where they're mining for diamonds uh, to down in in Namibia where they're mining for rare earth minerals and, and places like that. So um, it's pretty remarkable what the what how the Chinese have expanded. Uh, but in doing so, you know the Obama administration really tried to get the Chinese to understand that you have to do you have to sort of take on the responsibility of of being a, a global player, uh, and that means helping to respond in a case like this and. Uh, in, and the Chinese did so and in, in impressive fashion. Reed Wilson, the book is Epidemic, Ebola, the Global Scramble to Prevent the Next Killer Outbreak. Reed, I thank you so much for spending time with us. Hey, thanks a lot. It was a real lot of fun. Thank you. And thank you for listening and for joining us here on Radio Who, What, Why. I hope you join us next week for another Radio Who, What, Why podcast. I'm Jeff Sheckman. If you like this podcast, please feel free to share and help others find it by rating and reviewing it on iTunes. You can also support this podcast and all the work we do by going to whowhatwhy.org forward slash donate.